Con. If this is your first time seeing one of these videos, you definitely want to jump back and go check from Lesson 1 and move up to here. There are a couple things that we've covered that might be a little important, but for those of you who are following along, the first thing we're going to do is go over sort of our homework assignment that I gave you last time. Um, the idea of the homework assignment was to have you take the name, the age, the height, and the birthday of a person using a program, and then display all of that into into the terminal. So here, what I've done is I've just done a real simple, quick version of this to kind of show you how it works. Um, what I did to solve this is I set four variables. Those variables were name, age, height, and birthday. I named them after what was going to be stored in them, so I could keep track of that. And then each of them is set to the function out of input, and each one asks a question. So we talked about input during the last lesson. Input asks a question, then stores that inside something. So we'll just look at name to kind of they all work the same way, but name is the first one, so we'll look at that one. So name is going to be set equal to the input of the question, what is your name? So the way that works is in the terminal, it's going to say, what is your name? I'm going to type in a name, and whatever I type in gets stored inside the variable name. Same thing with age, height, and birthday. Whatever I put there is just going to get stored inside that variable. So to actually make the program run, I just did a print function, and it prints a string that says your name is with a space, and I put the space there so it would space the next thing out over a space. And then I'm going to concatenate or add. When you're using strings, they call it concatenate. I'm going to concatenate the name variable. So whatever was stored in name will get printed there. Then I'm going to concatenate another string. And this one says your age is. And I put spaces at the beginning and spaces at the end to make sure that there was some space in between the variable and the string. And then I concatenate age. And then I concatenate another string that says you are with spaces around it. Then I concatenate height. Then I concatenate another string that says tall and your birthday is with spaces around it. And then I concatenate birthday. So that should print all of that stuff in the terminal. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to run this and see if it works. Now you're going to see I'm in Emacs where last time we were in REPL.IT. Like I said, I'm going to jump around. But you're going to get to see right now one of the very cool reasons that I like uh, to use Emacs for things. So I just started a Python interpreter inside of my Emacs, which is kind of cool. Um, now, this is a little tiny, so what I'm going to do is make that a little bigger. Okay, it should be uh, maybe maybe one more. Let's try one more. There we go. That's probably big enough for you to see. So I have this interpreter running. I'm going to go over here and let's run this program there. So it says, what is your name? And I'm going to just go ahead and type that in. So my name is Josh. What's your age? I'm 39 years old. What is your height? On a good day, when I'm not lying, we're going to say 5'11". And what's your birthday? My birthday is March 27th. Okay. Now, when I hit this, it should store all of that in those variables and then print out my string. And it says, your name is Josh. Your age is 39. And you are 5'11 tall. And your birthday is March 27th. So this worked exactly the way that I wanted it to. There's nothing strange going on. Um, now, like I said in the last lesson, you could have written this program lots and lots and lots of different ways. This is just one way to write it. It's the simplest way I could think of to write it. Um, you could make it a little more elegant. It could maybe even be a little more hacky. That's fine. Um, as long as it works, it works. So the whole idea of these homeworks is to get you to just sort of play with the code. Um, so if you've got an answer, that's good enough. If it looks close to this and it returned the values that you uh, had asked for, that's all we're looking for. Okay, so that's the homework. Let's talk about what we're going to do today. So last time we talked about strings and how strings are a data type. And that's just a type of data that the computer, in well, Python in particular, can play with. And we said that strings were words, and they're words that the computer can't really read. Um, they can process them. They can do things to those strings, like concatenate, but it doesn't really read them. The computer doesn't know what is your name. It doesn't know what that means, but it can play with that string. Um, today, we're going to deal with numbers, and that's going to be kind of easy because we should all have a good idea of what numbers are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to idle, and idle is the built-in Python interpreter. Once again, I'm going to switch around so you see different things. I want you to have not get confused by the editors, but just see that the code is similar. Now, right here, if you look at this, you can probably notice up here at the top um, 
this looks awfully similar to over here at the top of my Emacs. That's because these are both Python interpreters. These are really running the same program behind the scenes. Um, idle just only has the interpreter. There's not a place to write code. You write your code in the interpreter. Okay, so I'm going to use this to sort of type some things, but you'll see that a lot of this really isn't um, that complicated. We know what numbers are for the most part. Now, Python has two different categories of numbers that we're going to talk about today. There are uh, integers and floats. Okay, now, if you paid attention in math, you probably can figure this out fairly easily. An integer... It's just a whole number, right? That's in probably all the way back in fifth and sixth grade math. You learned that integers are just whole numbers. And the same holds true for Python. If it's a whole number, we just call it an integer. Now, the difference is if it's a float, that means it has a decimal point. And decimal points are kind of important. Um, you can do certain maths with certain kind of numbers. If I took an integer and did some math with a float, it's going. the answer is going to be a float. If I did math with two integers, the answer is going to be an integer. And, and we'll see how this works. But really, you need to pay attention when you're writing your code if a number is a float or if it's an integer because those are two totally different things. Now, if I get confused, okay, there's a function in Python called type. Okay, and I could do type, and let's just put in the number five. Now, when I evaluate this, it says class int, I-N-T. That means it's an integer. Okay, let's try a float. Uh, let's just do 5.0. That is an integer, right? 5.0 is an integer. It's actually a float. If there's a decimal point, even if that decimal point is zero, Python considers it a float. So you just have to kind of be cognizant and aware that these are two different ideas, that whole numbers are going to be your integers and that floats are going to be anything with a decimal point. Now, the nice thing is the operators that you can use on numbers are pretty much exactly the same as math. There's a couple that are a little different, and that's just because of the way that uh, Python does some things. But really, for the most part, you're going to understand these. If I were to write something like this, 3 plus 2, what do you think the answer is going to be? It's going to be five, right? And that it works just the same way. So in math and in Python, we would use the same terminology. The plus is an operator. Okay, it is a thing that does a thing. Um, you can almost think of it again like a little program, and then it does things to operands. Okay, this is the doer. These are the things that it's being done to. Okay, so our operator is the plus sign, or summing, or adding, or if it's strings, we call it concatenating. These are all the same thing. They're just different words. Um, if we were to, let's say, do this. Oh, that's the wrong thing. Three minus two. What do you think would happen? Well, the answer should be one. Okay? Now, let's play with this. Let's say 3.0 minus two. Okay, so really here I have a float and an int. Let's see what happens. When I hit that, it returns a float. Okay, so I kind of think of floats as like, funnily enough, a little virus. Um, if there's a float anywhere in your math, it converts your answer to a float. Um, so that's a good thing to keep in mind. Now, let's keep going. Let's see some more of these operators. We've got three. Then I'm going to do a little star. And two, the asterisk. Um, here, when I do this, if you, you've done some computer stuff before, you may know this. The answer is six. So what does that operator do? Well, that operator does multiplication. So that's three times two. Okay. Now I'm going to change the numbers so this uh, comes out a little easier. Let's do six and then slash two. Okay. Looks like a fraction. And when I was a math teacher, one of the things that I taught people is that every fraction is a division problem. So just like this, it's a division problem. And it's 6 divided by 2 equals the float 3. Now, this is interesting. Division makes floats. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. Now, if let's do something that's not going to be even. Let's do 13 
and let's divide that by, mm, let's just do two. That should give me a decimal, right? 6.5. Cool, right? So I can get exact numbers with two integers that will divide and give me a float which is kind of how a calculator works, and that's how we want it to work. This used to not be the case with Python. Python was not this smart in the past, but now with Python 3, this is this is built into here, which is nice. Um, now, let's say that I wanted to do 13 divided by 2, but I didn't care about the 0.5. Didn't care at all. Wasn't something I was interested in. I just wanted the 6. There's actually an operator for that, and it's double slash. So if I do this, my answer is going to be 6. Okay, so so far everything looks good. That's the first new thing that you haven't seen before. Now, um, there's a thing that is in most programming languages that is called a modulo. Now, modulo is a funny word, and they use the uh, percent sign to represent it. So if I was going to put that there, that's the sign for modulo. Modulo is just a fancy word of saying remainder. Okay, so if I did 10 divided by 3, okay? 10 divided by 3 would be, it goes in three times, right? And then I'd have some left over. So I'm going to be 3 point something, right? So 3 point 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, or 3 and 1 third. If you're a math geek, you probably know that. Okay, what if I just wanted the remainder? I just wanted that point 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. You could use modulo for that. And it gives me 1. Hmm, interesting. So it rounded that up to the nearest integer. Um, so you you will play with this and figure that out eventually. But there there's some rules to modulos. But one of the things that modulos are very good for is finding out if things are factors of each other, which you tend to do in programming a lot. So it's a thing to keep in mind. The other thing that's on here is if we did a double star. And what this is is exponents. This would be 3 to the second power, which is 9. And really, those are your simple operators inside Python. Those are the ones that you're going to use the most. There's not really a whole lot more than that. There are some, but usually if you're going to do that, you're going to be importing some different libraries into play with, which is something we'll talk about way down the line. That's We're nowhere near there yet. So you just really want to focus on these basic ones. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these basic math functions, and let's create something. So to do that, I'm going to go back to Emacs here, and let me clean up my screen a little bit. I'm going to get rid of that guy. And we're going to go here. And we're just going to get rid of this example that we had. Okay. So let's say I want to do some math with Python. And really, a lot of people, Python is very good at doing math. That's one of the areas that it's really um, used for a lot in the real world. So let's say that I want to figure out the area of a square. Okay. Um, what do you need to do that? So if you pay attention in math class, area is equal to length times width, right? Okay, so I just put that there. And actually, let's talk about this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a hashtag in front of that. Now, what that is is commenting it out. Um, we talked about this a little bit at the end of lesson two, so I'll go into a little more depth in this. Commenting it out just means that don't pay attention to this line. Um, the computer cannot figure out what it is. So for me, that is just a piece of writing for me to look at. The computer just ignores it as soon as you put that uh, pound sign in front of it or the hashtag or the octothorpe. Um, now, kind of like strings. I said strings are things that computers don't understand. Um, the computer does not understand a comment either. It's made for you to read and you to read only. The difference between a string and the difference between a comment is that a comment the computer will never look at. It is just completely invisible to the computer. A string, the computer can look at it and do some things to it, but it really doesn't understand what it means. Here, the computer doesn't understand what it means because it never looks at it. So I can put that there as a note to myself. And a lot of times when you're writing code, you want to document your code. You want to leave some notes for yourself or for others. or put. Sometimes you put a little to-do list in your program, like, oh, to-do, do, go back and fix this thing. Um, that's when you would use a comment. Or if you want to keep a part of the program from running, you can comment it out. And that's actually what we did in lesson two, is we just commented out something that we didn't want to run. 
So here I just made a note that we know that area is equal to length times width. Okay. So how do I get the length of a square? Well, if we were running a program, we'd probably ask, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, sot. We're going to say side, uh, if I could type, side. We're going to set a variable called side, and we're going to ask what that is. Now, if this is a square, if you remember all the way back to math, um, a square, both sides are the same, right? Or all four sides would be the same. So we should only need a side one time, okay? So input, and we could say, what is the length? Oh, we need to turn this into a string. Now, how did I know that that needed to be a string? because it didn't change to blue. And in my editor, blue means a string. So what I had forgotten to do was add the quotation marks. So it wasn't going to work, right? What is the length of the square? And we'll put a little question mark there. I'm going to leave a space, so it leaves a space there. And then we're going to close that. Now, that's going to give me a variable called side. Now... Let's set another variable. Let's call this area. And area is going to be equal to, well, really, mathematically, length times width, and length and width are the same thing. So I could just do side, and then I'm going to multiply that by the number 2. Okay? Seems logical. Okay, so I'm taking the input of a side. We're going to see, get that number. We're going to store it in that variable, and then... We're going to look at area, and area is going to be set equal to, area is a variable, it's set equal to whatever side is times 2. That should be my area. Okay. Now, if I were to run this right now, it's not going to do anything uh, because all I did was set some variables. So actually, let's see what happens here. And it does nothing. Okay. So I am going to... Let me pull back up my Python interpreter here. Let's go here, buffers, Python. Okay, so it just asked me what the length of the square is over here. Let's put, uh, let's do a simple number. Let's do four. So four times four would be 16. It just returns four. It didn't do what I, it didn't figure out what the area was. Well, actually it did. We just never asked the computer to tell me what area was. And this is goes back to what we were talking about in lesson two. Computers aren't that smart. Uh, they only do exactly what you tell them to do. So what we need to do is we need to go back to our program, and we need to tell our program, hey, um, why don't you tell me what area is? So the way we do that is I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to put a uh, print statement in here, and we are just going to print area. Now if I save that, and then let's run it, we go over here, and I put 4 in. Hmm. What happened here? It took whatever side was, which is the number 4, and it did it twice. Once again, computers aren't that smart. <laughs> so what we need to do is we need to make sure that side is a number. Because right now, what, it, what happened? When we type in 4 for the length of a square it thinks that that's a string. And so it did the string times two. Just like when we were concatenating, it would take and add two things together. This is doing exactly that. It's concatenating. It's putting together the two fours that we put in there. So this is a common bug that you'll find because people you know, don't think about it that often. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over here and I'm going to show you another function. So this is another function to put in your notes. Now I could pull up my notes. Actually, here, I'll, I'll, let's do that real quick. Let's do Nope, that's not what I wanted. Okay. And let's go here and here. And then I could go in here and pull up, let's see, my aux brain, which I have here. And I could start typing in here. Once again, this is one of the reasons I like Emacs. I can put everything into one window, and it's kind of nice. Um, I'm going to assume that you're just going to start putting things in the notes for yourself. Uh, me telling you what to put in there is not going to be nearly as valuable as you deciding what to put in there and how to put it in. I would tell you every time I show you a function, I'd probably put it in my notes. Um, I may have put in my notes something about, oh, if something weird happens where I, I do something like this and the strings 
or the strings do some math instead of it being an integer like it's supposed to be, um, maybe I need to fix that. So I'm going to leave it up to you to make those decisions. But what I'm going to do is go up here and we're going to fix this by we're going to call a function called int. And all int does is it takes whatever's inside the parentheses and turns it into an integer. Okay, so the function takes an input called side in this case. So we're going to take the string that is side and we're going to change it into an integer. Let's see if that actually does what we want it to do. Okay, so we go over here. What is the length of your square? I'm going to jump over here. Let's put it in four. And then I got eight. So four times two. Well, that's not the way it is. It should be side times side, right? Okay, so now we know this. So if I wanted to do side times side, what could I do mathematically? Well, I could just do the same thing again. Once again, this is a way to do it. There are multiple ways to do it. So we go over here. Let's try it again. Let's put four in here. And my head is in the way. <laughs> and it gives me, let me duck out of the way. And it gives me 16, which is what I expect. Okay, so now I have what I need. This is an area program. I can type in the side of a square, and it's going to give me the area of that square. Now, it's useful for squares, but maybe I need to change this to work with any rectangle. That might be the next step if I was going to continue to write this, is to, to make it a little more useful in real life. Okay? So, with all that being said, what I want you to do, and this is going to be your homework for next time, I want you to write a program very similar to this one, to find the volume of a rectangular prism. Okay, So you may need to look up rectangular prism again to get the exact definition um, because that is going to change the code a little bit. Uh, so think, think about that a little bit. Bonus points, if you can use what we did here to figure that out, you could use this area to do that as well. So think about that, put it together. Once again, I just want to kind of, at this point, we're starting to get to where we're writing some code and things are getting a little hairy. Don't forget that this is not supposed to be easy. And this is not a skill that you watch a video once and that's it. Don't be afraid to watch this multiple times. Don't be afraid to jump back and look at certain sections of this. If you're having problems, it's okay to jump around. Your notes should help you kind of not have to do that very often, but really don't be afraid to watch this multiple times. If you get this the first time, you're a genius. Um, I know for me, it was very hard to learn this starting out. So don't be too hard on yourself. Uh, do the effort to sort of go back and really think about what you're doing and really get the skill. It's not, the homework is not the end goal. The homework is just for you to work on it. Okay. So with that, I will see you guys next time.